the peripheral clocks in the gut regulate glucose absorption. Clocks in the muscle, adipose tissue, and the liver regulate local insulin sensitivity. The pancreas regulates insulin secretion. So what can happen is we have one clock happening in the brain, other clocks happening in all these organs, and through our lifestyle, we butcher it. Welcome to Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, talking wellness and weight loss for real life. We're here to clear up the myths, misinformation, bad science, and marketing to teach you how to eat and how to cheat. Are you ready? I'm having salad with a side of fries. Hey there. Welcome back to another episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, of course, always here with you. And joining me today is Alexis. So Alexis and I met through networking. I want to say it was like 2020, I think, right? And then continued to stay in touch. Anyway, long story short, we're here. Alexis, welcome to this side of the microphone of Salad with a Side of Fry. Thanks for having me. What a Absolutely. Treat. I'm so excited that we're finally doing this. And by the way, for everybody, Alexis and I feel the same way about the heat and summer. So I have <laughs> to ask you before we start, how are you handling everything? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, by um, mostly staying inside, taking cold baths, and staying away from people because I get semi homicidal when I'm too hot. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I know exactly what that's like. <laughs> I think I've taken three showers today. Yeah. Went to a couple good movies over the weekend. That helped. Oh, that's good. What'd you see? Yeah. We saw a French film called My Donkey, My Lover, and I. I'm going to venture to say it's not quite my genre. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what your genre. We haven't talked film. Before. I don't know. We haven't talked films. It's charming in the French countryside, quirky, worth watching. And then we saw an old film, which is Chow Manhattan, which was the last film that Evie Sedgwick did before her untimely passing. Oh, wow. A whole range of film cinematic yeah. experiences. <laughs> I don't mean the last. I'm like, I saw the Elvis movie. That was very cultured for me. Hey, right. That was actually good. <laughs> and that was I thought it was film. good, too. That was a good film. It was. So. All right. Well, let's get this party started. I suppose as a preface to today's topic. So we've had episodes on sleep and morning routines and breakfast. <laughs> and I think there's really like an underlying piece to all of those conversations that deserves our attention. And it also addresses some of the fad stuff that a lot of people are talking about right now. So we can talk about that too. So anyway, the underlying theme, right, of all of those episodes and our focus for today is circadian rhythm. So I'm excited about this. You're very smiling, fancy. So, yeah. Right, very fancy. <laughs> so I, I don't want to get too deep before we tell our members what they're getting. So members, your recipe is for zucchini tzatziki slaw. So it's a great way to use a vegetable of the season that frankly, to me at least, can get kind of boring, right? Zucchini, how many ways? But especially- How many mushy ways. Right. And especially if you're growing it, you're going to have it coming out of your eyeballs. So this is a great way to use it. The recipe is like, it creates like this sort of refreshing slaw instead of a coleslaw kind of a thing. I promise you, your family's going to find this irresistible, <laughs> right? It could be like a side for grilled meats and vegetables. Or it could be, you know, the thing to bring when you have to bring something somewhere. So to get this recipe, be sure you're a member. Because if you're not a member, what would you like, right? Tell us what we could do to have you join us for the membership. Here's what you do. You go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. This membership is a whopping $10 a month. For that $10, you get a weekly recipe, monthly articles or tools, extra discounts from me and our partners, plus access to live Q&A sessions. All of this delivered to your inbox on Fridays. And at $10 a month, it really does pay for itself because when you take advantage of all of the offerings, you're saving far more than the $10. So as I always say, show yourself that your health is a priority with this membership. Plus, being a member supports this podcast and this community so that we can continue to do this because I would love nothing more than to keep showing up every week and having these conversations with you and bring you these experts. So here's what you do. You go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries, or you don't have to remember that. Just click the link in the show notes. Once you're there, you will click support now, type your email and payment or use Apple Pay. It's less typing. 
and then click subscribe. You're all set. You'll get this week's recipe for the zucchini tzatziki slaw. All right, Alexis, in, in thinking about this, I was like, I suppose we should start with sort of what is it, how it gets disrupted, the implications of when it doesn't function properly, and then what we can do about it, right? How to bring ourselves back. What do you think? Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. I'm in. All right. <laughs> well, you're here. You're in anyway. <laughs> I appreciate Hang it. Hang up though. at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what is circadian rhythm? Okay. So technically, it means in Latin about a day, right? Close to around a day, meaning 24 hours. So it's like our body's internal clock. You might hear it referred to as chronobiology. And what's interesting, and maybe I'm skipping ahead a little bit, we have the main circadian clock that is in the brain. Okay. So, well, I guess maybe before I say this part, by the way, we aren't the only things that have a circadian rhythm. So even like bacteria and plants and algae, frankly, all animals have a circadian rhythm, right? We think of it like we're diurnal, right? We tend to be awake during the day and asleep at night, hopefully. We know other animals to be nocturnal, right? So that's sort of some of those words that we already know that are sort of in this space. So theoretically, our circadian rhythm is controlling those sleep-wake cycles. It's regulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN for short, go with SCN, you'll sound very smart, right? It's located in the brain at the base of the hypothalamus, right at the back of the brain. It's like 20,000 nerve cells create this part of the brain. And what's really interesting is a lot of these nerves connect directly to the optic nerve. So that's giving us, right, that light through the eye sends the signals directly to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. (laughs) Say that five times fast. Yeah, right. And don't make me say it again. From now on, we're calling it the SCN, right? (laughs) (laughs) So where this gets, I think, particularly interesting is that we have sort of like the part of the brain, right? This SCN is like the master clock. And then every cell, every organ has its own circadian rhythm. So without the sun, right, without the master one in the brain, they would all run on their own clocks. They would run like asynchronously. So think of it like this was the best description I've ever heard. It's like the SCN is like the conductor of the orchestra that keeps the brain and the body in time so that everything is running together. It's so interesting because the first thing I thought of was a metronome, which is it's a automatic version of a conductor keeping things in time, a lot less sophisticated, but same, right. <laughs> same <Right>. vicinity. <laughs> exactly. But so what actually happens for most of us is that the circadian rhythm of many of our organs become asynchronized with the SCN in the brain. And so our clocks aren't working together. And there's a lot of things that we do in our lifestyle that sort of pushes these peripheral clocks out of whack. So Before we sort of get into those things, I think it's really interesting. Human babies are born without any rhythm. And that rhythm starts to develop around six months, right? We start to see those patterns, right? They're maybe sleeping for longer, right? We can go longer. I say this like I know I don't have children. So (laughs) neither of us do. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But so I've been told. Right. My friends' kids around that time, you know, and then even thinking back to our own adolescence, right? We see big shifts in adolescence where they're sleeping, right? They could sleep half the day, yeah. right? A lot of that is biological and part of that circadian rhythm, but then we also have sort of all these lifestyle things that disrupt us. Again, before we get to that, there is some evidence that some people have a genetic variation, so what we call a SNP, that makes them more of a morning person or a night owl, And that has impacts on melatonin production where like it doesn't end till a little bit later in the morning. But having said that, it is pretty rare. Most people think they have this mutation, but or (laughs) variation, really, I should say rather than mutate. Most people think they have it, but it's really just that like we think we've trained our body to a different thing. It's lifestyle. (laughs) Right. And so here's what's interesting, right? So Well, I feel like all this is interesting to me, but (laughs) (laughs) 
blood pressure, appetite, memory consolidation, food intake, energy expenditure, right? Glucose metabolism, insulin sensitivity, all of those things run in a 24 hour process and are controlled very much in part by these clocks. So if you think about like the peripheral clocks in the gut regulate glucose absorption, clocks in the muscle, adipose tissue, and the liver regulate local insulin sensitivity. The pancreas regulates insulin secretion. So what can happen is we have one clock happening in the brain, other clocks happening in all these organs, and through our lifestyle, we butcher it, <laughs> right? <laughs> the biggest I just hear dis- a lot of clocks going off simultaneously and I making know. a lot of noise right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> not and cute. by the way, the irony is not lost on me that we are recording this later in the evening. <laughs> and then there's that. <laughs> right. You know, because we are night owls. <laughs> yep. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> so the big disruptors, light, sleep and meal times. So think of it even like jet lag, right? Time zones right. can mess us up because it's like the light cues. We are meant to have bright light at dawn and darker light in the evening. This is one of my favorites. So because our gut and our GI tract and all these other organs have, you know, their own circadian rhythm, mm-hmm. our poop can actually get jet lag. Oh yeah. I right. And a, a lot of us notice it, right? We feel off when mm-hmm. we travel. We talked about this in our poop episode called The Down and Dirty. That was part one. <laughs> part two is coming later this year. But, you know, so basically there was a study where in the study they fed mice poop. They fed and they them fed, poop? It, yeah, basically. Okay. <laughs> so the poop fed to the mice after flights versus the poop from before the flight, the mice got fatter. Fascinating. Well, I was wondering because flight attendants used they used to have like very strict, you know, body sizes yep. and weight. They would weigh them, and it was quite a thing. Well, that was a whole other, uh, yeah, as a whole other time and era. But I was just thinking with this on top of everything because they must have had no their circadian rhythm must have been completely thrown off. But their flight schedule, yes. like how did they ever poop? Who knows? Right. Maybe they got used to it and then they thought they were fine, but their clocks probably were not so fine. Right. It's like we're in a night night shift. Right. Right. And so, okay. So that brings us to shift workers. So most of us, right? Like we think of shift workers as people like those in a hospital, right? Maybe they're on for three days straight, 24 hours, right? And then they're off for two days or things like that. Or some people work the night shift, right? Like, Amazon employees, <laughs> right? Like there are definitely people who are working all night. And so a lot of us, we think, oh, well, that's not me, right? Now leave it to our European counterparts to be a little more forward thinking in health, right? So there was sort of like an international agreed upon definition of shift workers in Europe where they a bunch of health practitioners decided, right, if you stay awake for two to three hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. for 50 days in a year, you could be considered a shift worker. Let me point out to everyone, 50 days a year is about one day a week. So one good late night (laughs) and you're a shift worker. Right. Or for some of us, it's weekends versus during the week. Yep. You know, or it's I have a crazy deadline. I'm going to stay up. Or right, like we have all been there. And so many of us, even just trying to have a social life, (laughs) right, (laughs) have created the situation where internally in our body, we're shift workers and we didn't realize it. And we're not being compensated for it. No. And so what I think happens too, that sort of the counterpart to this is that when we have that one late night in the week, It adjusts our clock, which can take two to three days to get back on track. If we take the one day a week, and this is being pretty conservative, right? One day a week where we stay up till midnight, right? Or maybe get up extra early to catch a flight. One day. Then it takes two to three days to get it back on track. How many days in the week? Seven. We're now talking three to four days. So essentially 50% of the time, 
our internal clocks are off. And I totally, and I'm definitely like, I'm not an early night person, but it definitely creeps later over the weekend. And it's true. It's like, then by Monday and by Tuesday, like I'm kind of almost back into the rhythm and then I throw it off again. Right. So that's a big piece, right? So the sleep shifts it, the light shifts it with jet lag or us staring at our computers. We've talked about blue light before, right? Yep. Blue light, seventh grade science, light spectrum. Blue light is the closest to daylight on the light spectrum. So when we sit at night at a computer, like we are right now, like we are right now, (laughs) (laughs) right? Looking at our phones, like the other night, I was laying in bed, but on my phone researching new suitcases because I needed a new suitcase, right? Like why I needed to do do that at at midnight, right? (laughs) But I'm staring, right? Staring at the phone, watching TV. Oh, I'm just going to read a little bit, but we read on our iPad or device that's giving us this blue light, right? So what ends up happening, the optic nerve is essentially sensing daylight, which is sending signals to the brain to say, whoa, melatonin, we actually don't need you. Sending signals to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, right? To say, no, no, it is morning, right? Wake up. And so these clocks start to get out of sync. And then you go to mealtimes. We are eating sets the clock for the gut when we eat late at night, right? When our body is not naturally producing insulin, not naturally sensitive to glucose, right? All of these kinds of things. And we have a recipe for obesity and diabetes and metabolic disorder. Perfect recipe. Right. So essentially, the things that disrupt it, light, sleep, and mealtimes. So then what happens, right? The implications of this dysfunction is really metabolic dysfunction. Dysfunction, dysregulation. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So, and what ends up happening is that the peripheral clock aren't in sync with the master clock. And then frankly, our metabolism doesn't know when it's supposed to rev up or wind down, right? So there are studies that show circadian misalignment results in decreased glucose tolerance. Mm. Ongoing research are calling it one of the key factors in the rise of type 2 diabetes worldwide. Fascinating. Right? So so much less to do with what you eat, but when you eat. Yes. So there are actually studies that show the exact same meal at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. is better handled by the body than the exact same meal at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. And so we always talk about it's the quality of the food that matters. Right. And the timing matters. So we'll talk more about it in a minute, you know, about what we can do and how we sort of bring things back into, you know, alignment. Alignment. But you're exactly right on that. We also know that when we don't sleep well, that can lead to increased food consumption for a variety of reasons too, right? So now we're sort of adding insult to injury. (laughs) There is some research, like we talk about that often as connected to our body's response to leptin and ghrelin, those hormones that tell us when we're satisfied and when we're hungry. Mm -hmm. There is some research connecting short sleep patterns with disruption of the endocannabinoid system, which may also lead to our increased food consumption. Something that's really interesting in all of this, when we look at psychiatric diseases, mood disorders, Mm -hmm. most of them are connected to disruption in the circadian rhythm. Schizophrenia, substance use disorder, connected to circadian rhythm disruption. Fascinating. And really fascinating. And there's some research that's connecting relapses in substance use to circadian rhythm disruption. Wow. That's a game changer. Really. It's huge. Yeah. And part of it is because it also is involved in sort of the brain centers for mood and reward. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's sort of all connected. You know, there are some treatments for bipolar. It's called social rhythm therapy, where it's almost like a social schedule to regulate the rhythms and it can help prevent sort of the manic and the depressive episodes. So it's really interesting. Like it's all connected. And, you know, there's even some research around this is maybe less about when our circadian rhythm is disrupted, but more about sort of how important the timing of things is. So 
blood pressure medications are more effective at night because of the natural biology of what else is happening in the body at night. But often doctors will be will tell their patients to take it in the morning because I think sometimes it's like we have morning routines in a different way than we have evening routines. So even though it's more optimal in the evening, they're afraid they'll forget to take it in the evening. Is that what you mean? I, I think so. I mean, that's me trying to rationalize. They may part not of know. It. Well, that's the other, I was just going to (laughs) say, some of this research is really new. Like there's research that chemo at certain times of the day is less toxic to the body because of the circadian rhythm of the cells around the tumor. That's the word tumor. So it's really interesting. I mean, it's like we even think of those metabolic disorders and obesity, right? If we eat meals at times of the day when our metabolism is not at its prime, right? Like if we eat in the middle of the night versus eating in the middle of the day, their circadian rhythm in the gut and the stomach are connected to that, right? There is also research connecting cancer to shift workers. I did know with shift workers that it, it can affect your lifespan, actually. Yes. Yeah. So shift work is linked directly to increased risk of cancer. And it's essentially like it's impacting the program cell death, the apoptosis, right? Like the normal life cycle of a cell is disrupted. You know, so then I'm just skipping through my notes to make sure we didn't miss anything. So we already talked about, you know, a meal in the morning versus a meal at night has completely same meal, different times, you know, like same meal, wrong time of day could double your blood sugar. Yet again, proving calorie in, calorie out is not correct. It's just not what it is. It's not the way it works. It's much more complex than that. Exactly. And then even further, there's some research showing that even a meal at midnight can snowball into the next day. We oftentimes we think, well, I still slept. And so it's a new day. Similar to that, skipping breakfast is one of the worst overall daily blood sugar control pieces. I I haven't skipped breakfast for years, but I did it in high school. Honestly, I have no idea how I functioned. Like it was completely normal to me. I have yeah, no but idea. that goes back to what we were saying before about how teenagers have this altered circadian rhythm where they generally sleep later, yeah. but we're forced to get up earlier. So it tracks. That makes sense. So essentially, like what happens with melatonin is that it decreases like as we wake up. So for most of us, I think it's about like an hour ish after we wake up. And so melatonin and glucose are actually connected. So there were studies also that people with diabetes have a mutation in melatonin receptors. Fascinating. That like melatonin makes our brain sleep and tells our pancreas to sleep. Right. So there are these cells like called islet cells, (laughs) right? So they don't produce as much insulin as they should when we eat. If there's melatonin, but, right? So then we right, eat at night or whatever. It's all asleep. this, right? Right. What right. are you doing eating? You're sleeping. Your body's telling the melatonin levels are telling me you're sleeping, so right. you shouldn't be eating. Exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's interesting that even to this day, like I, within the first hour, I eat, but I'm not usually hungry, like that hungry. Like I don't mm-hmm. wake up super hungry, and I do, for simplicity, since I have a lot of food allergies, I do actually just do a, a protein shake. It's easy. Yeah. It's ready to go. It's good nutrition. And then sometimes that's great. I'm great for three or four hours. And other times an hour later, I'm like, where's breakfast? Right. And But even your awareness of that is key. And I think that's really natural, right? That you notice a difference. It would be interesting to see if some of those days that were different depending on the sleep the night before or the sleep a couple days before. I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, usually I will say that the days that I don't get enough sleep, if I have to get up early for something unusually early, I am like ravenous and like, I I have to make sure to pack extra snacks because I will be starving those early flights. You know, it's like I had to get up at five, what time? Yeah. You know, there's an extra, you know, meal on the way to the airport too. Yeah. And so, I mean, paying attention to those things and then recognizing that we're going to be out of whack and that there are things we can do to help get it back together. And that's what we're going to talk about now, right? How do we sort of reset the clocks, get our clocks running together so that we're functioning well? In har- <laughs> right. In harmony. <laughs> Let's yes. go back to the musical the way I analogy. think of it. <laughs> well, so I also think of it, maybe this is like the, you know, the inner works and workings of a clock. Mm-hmm. Like an old school where there's all the gears. The gears. And the, mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know how to explain this. Even my, whatever I'm doing with my hands is not helping. 
<laughs> it's like, but you know, there's like the spokes of two different circles that like intertwine. And as they turn, like they all turn. It's sort of like we have the master one and then the ones for all the organs. And then all of a sudden you've got the one for the gut sort of trying to go a different direction when all the other ones are trying to go one direction, you know, or right. the maybe springs it are gonna slides pop off. out. Yeah. Or like maybe it slides away so it's no longer interlocking and then it's off and running in its own cycle. There's a lot that we can do thinking of it in that way, at least for me, I think is helpful. Right. That it's a, they're working together and the goal is to have them working together in harmony and that one shift will affect the others because our body's an ecosystem. Exactly. All right. So we'll get into everything we can do after a quick message from our partner for this episode, DNA Miracles. Because every child is a miracle. DNA Miracles provides the highest quality body and wellness products designed for babies, children, and expectant mothers. All products are gentle, easy to use, and 100% effective when used as directed. DNA Miracles partner with leading health professionals and scientists who follow the highest standards and ingredient selection to create the most effective skin, hair, and health solutions. As natural as possible, DNA Miracles is the best and safest option on the market for you and your little miracle. From expert pediatricians to real family testimonials, everyone has fallen in love with DNA Miracles. So today, right, we're talking about our body's natural rhythms. I think a piece of this and creating our kids' natural rhythm is not just for all the adults, right? So that we don't mess it up, but creating it is a lot about the habits and routines for that rhythm, which includes bedtime and bath time. So that's why I want to remind you all of the DNA Miracles Natural Bath Time Box. So it comes with the natural foaming wash and shampoo, the natural hydrating body lotion, the natural diaper cream, and the natural soothing ointment. So I bring this up because it's also not just for baby. The foaming wash and shampoo is super gentle, like great for you if you have sensitive skin or any sorts of allergies. The ointment, like I don't know anybody else walking around in flip-flops and it feels like your feet are dry, right? (laughs) So that ointment on your feet, unbelievable. And it also doesn't leave your hands greasy, which is kind of nice. So anyway, you can get this whole kit and the little gift box for a whopping $57.50. The ointment on its own, by the way, is like $22.50. The lotion is $15.95. So the whole thing together is really a total steal. Plus, you get 10% off and free shipping for being a salad with a side of fries listener. So simply text the word miracles, M-I-R-A-C-L-E-S. Remember the S, it's miracles, plural, M-I-R-A-C-L-E-S to 844-947-4846. You'll receive the link and coupon code right to your phone. Again, simply text the word miracles, plural with an S, to 844-947-4846. This is a toll-free number. Standard text and data rates may apply. All right, Alexis, what's your guess for one thing we can do, or I guess maybe the biggest areas that we want to address to reclaim our circadian rhythm? I'm guessing it's going to be something like try to go to bed on time consistently. (laughs) You know, the thing I'm terrible at. (laughs) Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) Right. All right. So we have four pieces that we want to look at. Sleep rhythm, nutrition, exercise, and stress. So on the stress piece, right, cortisol plays into the disruption of this whole rhythm. And we know that already, but it sort of just layers on, right? So anything we can do to manage our stress is going to help this overall big picture and can also help sort of our response to what happens in this overall big picture, even when we are sort of out of sync. So then we'll start with the sleep because that's what (laughs) that's where you started. So yes, (laughs) right. In an ideal world, we have somewhat of a regular sleep time and wake time. In an ideal world, we're sleeping like seven to eight hours a night. I sort of go back and forth on sleep trackers. Like I tried one a couple of years ago, maybe it was last year. It made me a little cuckoo (laughs) because part of it was that I then had to sleep with my watch. So I had to find another time of day to charge my watch. And then I'd be looking at this data and, you know, trying to figure out the why to make the adjustments to be able to use the data. So if a sleep tracker would be helpful for you, great. I'm sort of neither here nor there on actually making that recommendation. P.S. We have somebody coming on the show later this year who we're going to talk about the tech of all those wearables and what works and what's really accurate and what's not and all that kind of stuff. Investing in blackout shades could be helpful. 
right? So that we're creating this darkness at night when we want it. And by the way, for us city dwellers. Yeah. And especially if you live somewhere where, you know, or even in the summer when the days are longer, but in order to get our seven hours, we might need to sleep a little past sunrise. That's okay. We just want the blackout shades to help create that dark environment. Bright light synchronizes your circadian rhythm, right? Bright light is actually the central, what we would call like the central pusher of the central clock. So what that means is first morning light, yes, avoid bright light at night. So in the evening, maybe we want to play, like tailor our indoor lighting. So we've already talked about blue light, right? Orange light is great at night. Think of like a candle's glow, right? Like how could you use lamps in your home? Like uh, my computer, by the way, I can't remember the name of the program that I downloaded, but you can Google and download one where I have times at might be eight or nine o'clock or somewhere in there. It automatically changes the color on my screen to be more like yellow orangish. I think Macs have a night mode that you can schedule for that as well. Yeah. Most of your phones have it. Yeah. A lot of devices have it built in. And then during the day, we want the blue light. We want to get out in the morning. So like in an ideal world, even if you eat your breakfast sitting by a window, it's helpful. It can actually, there is also like therapy for like seasonal affective disorder and some other mood things. It can improve mood and alertness if we get bright light, even during the day. So maybe like go for a walk at lunchtime, you know, getting some of that natural light. And by the way, it also doesn't matter even if it's cloudy outside, like it doesn't matter. Still do it. Still works. Still blue. Still works. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the seasonal light lamps, by the way. Um, When I came off of refined sugar, my seasonal depression pretty much vanished. Um, I'm so not surprised. Not a surprise at all uh, until COVID. And I think just being inside so much and not having human contact, my seasonal depression, not as bad as it was before when I had sugar, but I used the lights occasionally and a big fan. Yeah. So the lights are huge especially in the morning. And by the way, like it's really not about how early or late you wake up. It's more about how many hours of sleep you get and then what you do once you wake up, right? And then what you do to put yourself to sleep. That's Um, reassuring because I shifted my schedule. It was actually uh, encouraged. I was encouraged to experiment to see how long with being home so much, like I actually don't have to get up as early. So actually experiment how much time I do need to sleep. And I Mm -hmm. do kind of still sleep like a teenager. So my ideal is actually nine hours. Mm -hmm. So I don't always go to bed at midnight, but I try to go to bed around midnight and wake up at 930. Yeah. And then once you're up, you know, open the window, the shade, get the you know, those kinds of things. Like I bought one of those alarm clocks that has the light to sort of mimic the sunrise so that it goes Mm -hmm. off. So the light starts to turn on before the alarm goes off. It was a game changer. It's still a game changer, but I've sort of gone back to snoozing. So I now, I've said this before, I think I need to like move it across the room, but. (laughs) I have a second alarm clock. I am one of those. I have a second alarm clock in the bathroom that I have to get up and turn off because I used to sleepwalk as a kid and I will just sleep right through the alarm. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a piece of this in these conversations that always comes up around melatonin supplementation. So part of what, the daylight does is it turns the melatonin receptors to do their other job, right? Like it's sort of those same receptors have a different job at different times a day. And so it helps turn that over. Melatonin supplementation, I always warn people against, not because it's not helpful, it certainly can be helpful, but our body is extremely adapted. And so if it doesn't have to do something, it's not going to. So the more we rely on sort of this exogenous, right, this out of the body, right, we're adding melatonin, our body will make less of it on its own. So if you are going to use some melatonin, the other thing that can happen in that adaptation too, is that we need more and more of it for t- to get the same benefit. So if you are going to use a melatonin supplement, first of all, Fundamentally, I'm a much bigger fan of taking supplements or vitamins and minerals and nutrients that will support our body's own production of melatonin and doing some of these lifestyle factors to help our body produce its own 
And then on occasion, we can use a little bit of supplementation of the hormone. And in that case, you don't want to take it every day, right? Like we sort of cycle it, like take it a couple times and then not for a while. The other thing is that sort of when we think about what's happening, when our body produces melatonin, it happens in a different part of the body than when we ingest something and then we're processing it, right? So there's some arguments where like supplementation with melatonin is going to the liver and can help us then fall asleep. But like, you know, it's very different than sort of our body's own melatonin that's going to rise a couple hours before it's time to go to bed, peaks about an hour after we sleep, and then begins to decline about an hour after we wake up or so. So like, typically melatonin is the lowest, like two-ish hours after waking. You know, and essentially, right, when we supplement, we're shifting what that arc or that pattern looks like. So when it comes to the sleep stuff and the fact that we have turned ourselves into shift workers, we might want to rethink our socializing. And I say that with all the love and coming off of a weekend with friends where we did not do such things, (laughs) right? (laughs) But it makes the argument for happy hour versus late night. Very hard in New York. Even New York uh, nightlife has shifted earlier, just post COVID. Not that we're out of it, but you know, things close early now. But also like alcohol and caffeine are also going to disrupt this, right? We're more sensitive to the implications of alcohol when we're shift workers. So again, it's all sort of feeding into this loop. So the more we can disrupt that, the more we can sort of reclaim it, the better. Naps are an interesting thing. So naps may help some people if we're sleep deprived. And, you know, there are some researchers who will say that humans were designed to nap, that we're not actually diurnal right? That there's chemistry to being less alert right after lunch as per our biology, not just because of a blood sugar drop. The siesta that we don't observe. (laughs) Right. There are some who say that like our biology is designed to have like a 30 to 60 minute nap in the afternoon. So if that helps you, awesome. I'm a big fan of napping. I can sometimes overdo it and then I will throw off my night schedule, but I'm a big fan of the power nap, the 20 minute nap to just recycle and rejuvenate. And it, you know, it helps with the stress side of it. I also don't, I've been off caffeine for many years. So as soon as I took out caffeine, the naps became non-negotiable. Like I would just, my eyes would not stay open in the afternoon. And I was like, this isn't up for discussion. There will be a nap now. Yeah. So caffeine is a really interesting thing. Like, first of all, know yourself and know sort of your cutoff time in the day for, you know, when it's no more, whether that's noon or two o'clock or whatever. But it's interesting because for some people in the morning, caffeine or coffee can almost act like morning light in terms of giving us that wake up. But it doesn't give us mental clarity. It doesn't give us like the cognitive function. It just gives us that feeling of awake. So you still need your cup of coffee outside. Right. And then I think this brings us to food, right? So I think it sort of goes without saying, but of course I'm going to say it, right? Eating late at night disrupts all the things. So Because late night, our body cannot produce enough insulin to respond to the glucose. And in the morning, if we wake up and eat sugar or carbs right away, when that nightly melatonin is still higher, we can't produce the insulin. So it's really important. I talk about all the time, right? Like we did a whole episode on just breakfast, (laughs) right? (laughs) We really want to eat during the day. So we were talking about light being the central pusher for the central clock in the brain. Food intake is the central pusher for all of our organ clocks. So going back to what we said before about food timing, right? Food resets the circadian clock in the liver, the intestines, the stomach, the pancreas, like all these other organs. And this sort of brings up time-restricted eating or what has become known as intermittent fasting. Now, I want to be very clear here what has become known as intermittent fasting is a butchered version of time-restricted feeding. True time-restricted feeding has nothing to do with calorie consumption. In fact, the time-restricted feeding studies show exactly the same amount of food eaten. It's just done theoretically during daylight hours from an hour after waking up to two to three hours before bed, which if you listen to this podcast all the time is exactly what I tell everybody all the time, (laughs) right? (laughs) Our fasting time includes sleep. Our fasting time goes from about two to three hours before bed 
to about an hour after we wake up, you know, maybe an hour and a half, two hours after we wake up. But so depending, and if you're feeling really out of whack, and I've said this before, if you're feeling really out of whack, we talked about this in a lot, like with our aging episode, with metabolic health, we t- with sleep and stress and breakfast. Now, if you're really wanting to do it, you can find your food to daylight hours. If it's light, we eat. If it's dark, we don't. That would be, you know, sort of the most extreme. So meal timing, right? Like eight to six, give or take, if you're going to bed at nine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> those kinds of things. And what that can do, especially when our meal times are consistent, it can help with those peripheral clocks to know what's expected of them. And it's almost like when we eat, it can sometimes, it's almost like putting our clocks on what they would call metabolic jet lag. (laughs) So having that break gives our body that time to reset, but it also gives our body time to know like we want to eat more earlier in the day when our body, not first meal of the day, but earlier in the day when our body can produce the insulin and handle the blood sugar versus later in the day when we're already on that decline so that the melatonin can increase, right? It's all this balance and this sort of ebb and flow. And I feel like we really just have to get out of the way. (laughs) (laughs) That makes a lot of sense. It feels like I've read in plenty of places, they talk about you know, lunch actually sort of ideally being the larger meal of the day. And then, you know, you sort of ramp, you slowly start with breakfast and then sort of wind down to dinner. And I'm like, then why do I want dinner to be the biggest meal of the day? Like, is that just habit? Is that just fatigue? Is that? (laughs) That is American life creating this importance of a big dinner. That is the food industry trying to feed us all the things. All the things. Yeah. <laughs> Very technical <laughs> terms there. All the things, the starch with the corn, with the- Right. Because yeah, the, the by the way, the best time of day to eat those higher glycemic foods, the grains and the starches is not late in the day. Nope. It's also not first thing in the morning. Nope. It's <laughs> right. Lunch. It's midday. Yeah. Midday, late morning to midday. So then the last piece of this is exercise. So we mentioned this before, but getting out in the morning, do a walk in the morning, get your light and some movement, maybe even midday, like after lunch could be super helpful. There is, I did an episode like the right time of day to exercise. And the answer is whatever time you're going to actually do it. And I still stand by that. Having said that, when we look at circadian rhythm, there is a lot of benefit to exercising in the afternoon or evening. So for exercise in general, we want better muscle tone joint flexibility, right? That makes us less susceptible to injury when we have more energy and a higher body temperature and all those kinds of things, which happens for us naturally later in the day, not immediately upon waking. Now here again, caffeine can be a little bit of a workaround there. So some people you know, can get that sort of movement or energy with some caffeine in the morning to have their morning workout. Again, if morning is the only time you have to do it or you're going to do it, a thousand percent do it. But there is a piece of this and connected to some of our organs and the pancreas that like, you know, it could be super helpful. It is super helpful. There's definitely some science behind that afternoon, evening movement. Now, is there a point at which, and I could probably just also go back and listen to your exercise episode, but circadian rhythm wise, is there a point at which it's a little too late and then you'll sort of rev back up again? It can be for sure, but that's very individual. It sort of depends on what exercise you do and -hmm. what time you're going to bed. You know what I mean? But like for some people, it's exhausting and it wears them out depending on what they are. So like there was one study. Now, these were people who are metabolic. They call them healthy people, right? So essentially somebody who isn't diagnosed with the disease They were trying to manage glucose, so they gave them a high-intensity interval training workout in the morning versus the same people doing the same high-intensity interval training workout in the afternoon. The ones in the morning had increased blood glucose in the morning. Exercise in the afternoon had better glucose control for 24 hours. I do think, though, if the only time you're going to do it is the morning, do it, you know? Don't get caught up in the, it's the wrong time if it's not going to happen at all. Exactly. 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 So the long and the short of it is, you know, if we're going to sum this up, we want to try to get seven to eight hours of sleep each night. We want to go to bed generally around the same time and wake up generally around the same time. We want to get some morning light, like 30 to 60 minutes of light in the morning. First morning light is ideal. We want to eat about an hour after waking up. 
we want to finish with food two to three hours before bed. And as it gets dark, right after that meal, we want to start to control the environment in our home to bring the lights down and start to train our body to go to sleep. And turn off the phones. Turn off the phones. But there you have it. I mean, that's the circadian rhythm secret. That's not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> the magic right. formula. Yes. And don't turn yourself into a shift worker. Right. Right. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Any questions before we go to our nutrition nugget? Did you, and this may be a longer question, but did you find anything about meditation in terms of stress and resetting your, the internal rhythm? Like, was there anything about meditation actually being able to reset the synchronicity of the rhythms between the organs and the... I love this question. I didn't see anything in all the things that I was reading. Having said that, I believe there is... I think there is something to the stress management piece. I think there is something to the breathing piece, right? Of Part of what theoretically happens when we sleep. Right. It could be connected to even the power of the nap. I'm sure there is that research somewhere. There's more and more research now on meditation in general. Finally, yes. Yeah. So I should ask some of my meditation experts, but I'm sure it's out there. Just to sort of, you know, because meditation is one of my main stress things and it's Yes. Uh, stress management tools, I should say, not stress thing. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, I knew what you meant. <laughs> and I usually try to do it in the morning, but sometimes I forget. And then doing it in the afternoon is a great sort of reset. I have started to really, not started, but I've over the last probably nine months, a midday meditation, at least once a week. And I really enjoy it. Big fan. There's something to it. Yeah. Yep. I also do a meditation sometimes right before bed. Like I lay down and do a meditation and it helps me fall asleep instead of laying there thinking. Yeah. That's so. a good one. So Great there question. we go. We proved it. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Very Just scientific. Ask us. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's our scientific method because we said right. so. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So it's time for our nutrition nugget. You ready? Ready. This week we're talking about food porn. <laughs> you can laugh. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I had not seen that coming. <laughs> so in last week's episode, I mentioned that culinary school was my backup plan when I moved to New York. And growing up, I loved the Food Network. Like I watched cooking shows before the Food Network was a thing. I pretended to do cooking shows in my kitchen growing up. Like legit, I have a very vivid memory of doing like a cooking show with a hot pocket. <laughs> taking it out of the package, putting it in the microwave, taking it out of the microwave, slicing it on the diagonal, displaying the insides to the no one that was watching. So anyway. <laughs> I would pay to see that video. <laughs> right? It doesn't exist. At that time, video cameras were like 85 pounds and like, yeah. you know. The HS, anyway. yeah. So when I started to focus on my health and my habit, I noticed that watching these cooking shows made me hungry. Like I'd be watching Mrs. Fields had this show And of course, all she did was make cookies or even Emerald, right? Like I'd be watching something and the next thing you know, I'd be in the kitchen trying to mimic what they were making or find something that would fit the new craving that I had all of a sudden, right? So when I started to focus on all this stuff, I started calling it food porn. And okay, it might be kind of inappropriate, but like, I don't know, it just felt like the best description. So in realizing this, I made a rule for myself that I could only watch the Food Network while I was at the gym, like on the elliptical or the treadmill or one of those things, because then it didn't have the same impact. The other thing I noticed is that I could watch like food competition shows and it didn't have the same impact on my desire to eat as like watching other kinds of cooking shows. So like Top Chef, Iron Chef, those kinds of things became my (laughs) preferred cooking shows. So I share this with you so as to spark a bit of a brainstorm right? What's your food porn? What are the things that make you feel like eating or spark a craving for something that you otherwise didn't need or want and felt totally satisfied, right? So the first piece is just simply identify what it is. And then you can think about how you might go about handling that situation, right? Like for me, it was saying, okay, I watched the food competition shows instead, right? It really is about self-awareness and recognizing our own patterns and our tendencies so that we can better support ourselves and know what we need to do to keep moving forward. So then I saw an Instagram post the other day that said, looking up a restaurant's menu before eating there, call that four plate. That's a good one. There might need to be a symbol 
<laughs> right. <laughs> when I add sound effects to this. So it also made me laugh. But then it also reminded me that like sometimes the things we think we're doing to help us, like our best intention in looking at the menu ahead of time is to help ourselves. But maybe for some of us, it's counterproductive, right? Like what works for one person may not for another. So I think it just adds another piece to this puzzle and another really bad pun, more food for thought. <laughs> it's all that came to mind in this moment. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's it. Definitely for our have new- to think about that one. <laughs> food porn, right? Take a few minutes. You know, what might fall into your food porn or four plate category? <laughs> <laughs> and then how you want to handle those situations going forward. Food Alexis, for anything to add? Yeah. Food for thought. <laughs> food for thought. No, I'm right there with you with the competitions don't particularly make me hungry. And I yeah. had a moment watching the, I love the great British baking show. And at one yes. point I realized I can't, I literally can't eat any of it, right? I'm allergic to gluten and dairy. I don't eat refined sugar. I literally can't eat a thing. And I love the show to death. Also, that show is pure joy. Pure joy, pure joy. Cause it's competition, but like love, right? Like they just yeah. get an award. It's not like cutthroat, right? It's just beautiful. And they're all um, just rooting for each other. Like, I love that show. And everything is better with an accent. Also, the theme song to that show just makes me smile. Everything is better with an accent. Commercials, actually, was the first thing I thought of. Because I get yes. bored. I get bored. Not not the actual commercials. Not like, oh, seeing this. Because, you know, but like, I'm like, let's just get on with the show. And so, you know, because when you have the cheap Hulu where you still have the ads. So maybe I they- still use it with the ads. <laughs> So yeah, but then, yeah. you know, then I get bored. I'm like, hmm, what should I go get in the kitchen? Commercial yeah. break, kitchen time. Or I'm going to give you an assignment. Okay. Go to our nutrition nugget called 30, 30, 30. And 30, that will 30, give you 30. something to do during the mm-hmm. nutrition break screen <laughs> during the commercial <laughs> breaks. <laughs> Good Lord. All right, guys, that means it's time to call it. <laughs> Alexis. That's what happens when you record at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> right. Alexis, thank you again for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. Awesome. I appreciate you. So as always, everybody, I'm your host, Jen Trepic. Connect with me on Instagram or really all social media. I'm at Jen Trepic, J-E-N-N-T-R-E-P-E-C-K. Website is a salad with a side of fries.com. Wherever social media or the website, send a message. Please, I want to hear your takeaways, your ideas, your questions. This is also the easiest way to learn more about working with me as your health coach. If you are not already, please join our membership. Become a member by going to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. This shows your support for the podcast and this community, but more importantly, supports your health. And you'll get this week's recipe for the zucchini tzatziki slaw. So until next week, everybody, remember, sleep, move, eat, and take care of yourself so that we can have our body working in sync with our circadian rhythm. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. Congratulations for making yourself and your health a priority. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to click subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast platform, share us with a friend, and we'll be back next week. Always remember, you deserve it and you are worth it. Happy healthy.